Hello and welcome to GM Tips, a show where my friends and I share with you our thoughts and suggestions on how to game master your role playing game. I'm your host, Satine Phoenix, co creator of Maze Arcana and a dungeon master for D&D. Today we're going to discuss some pretty intense issues that come up in gaming. Subjects that have been asked the most in hashtag Ask Satine, crossing boundaries and character death. Subject number one, crossing boundaries. As a game master, you hope to weave interesting stories that entertain, challenge, and surprise your players. Everyone at your table volunteers their free time, and as we all know, free time is valuable. You try to prep everyone with session zero to get the feel for how you game master. You walk players through their character backgrounds to get an understanding of how they want to play. Give them pre-game house rules so everyone is on the same page on how to act and respond to one another during gameplay. You try your best to anticipate what your players might do. You try your best to feel the room and gauge how the table feels about different situations you put them through. Sometimes you can't anticipate or read the table. Sometimes you cross boundaries you didn't know were there in the first place. We are fallible creatures who sometimes miss signals and can take things too far. One way to attempt to avoid this is to ask your players, privately ahead of time, what items or issues are off the table. Compile these items into a list with your own off-limit subjects and tell your players during the pre-game house rules, these items are off the table and might trigger someone sitting at the table with you. As a game master, it's your responsibility to provide a safe space for your players to open their imaginations and play. Do your best to listen and navigate around subjects that make your players feel uncomfortable, still telling your story for the rest of the players. As a player, it's your responsibility to let the game master know what your hard limits are. Do not assume a thing is common sense or that they should know. We all have a history of experiences that lead us to the boundaries that protect us, and we each are allowed to be uncomfortable when a situation does not feel right. Communication is key. Players, here are some ways for you to communicate to your game master or fellow players that something is making you feel uncomfortable. Tip number one. As we saw in Jason Carl's episode of GM Tips, Come up with a hand signal to communicate you're approaching an emotionally triggered state. Some suggest thumbs up, thumbs middle, thumbs down. Some ask okay or not okay. I prefer green, which means good, yellow, which means warning, and red, which means stop. Share the signal with the table or GM before the game starts. Tip number two. If an issue arises during the game, take a deep breath, write your concern on a note, and give it to the game master. Tip number three. Another way to discreetly communicate this during the game, take a deep breath, excuse yourself from the table, and go for a brief walk to the restroom and calmly think through your concern. Return with a note to the GM letting them know you need to talk privately because an issue arose and perhaps this is a good place for the group to take a break. Or return with a note about your concern and you would like to continue gaming to deal with the issue in character. Or you just want to keep playing with the game master hoping that they're sensitive to the issue. Tip number four. Role play it. In character, discuss with the other characters what makes you feel uncomfortable and resolve it in game with your party. Tip number five. If you don't feel any of these ways are working, then take a deep breath, raise your hand, and let everyone know you're uncomfortable and need to take a break. Or maybe you'd like their help with the issue. Talking it out with your friends as soon as possible may prevent emotions from getting out of hand. Bearing through these emotions for the sake of your friends doesn't do anyone any good. Your friends are there to play with you. Making sure the sandbox is safe to play is in everyone's responsibility. Game masters are not mind readers. If you're an excellent role player, we don't know if you're expressing yourself in character or actually have an issue as a person playing the character. Help us help you during moments of distress in game. Subject number two, character death. Even though in our fantasy games, death isn't the end of your character, when a character dies, the player often feels intensely about it. If it's your first character death, you might take it personally. Some people don't care. Sometimes you sacrifice yourself for the good of the group and you go out in a blaze of glory with the story of an epic death. And sometimes you fill your second death saving throw and you go out in a stupid anticlimactic way that doesn't feel fair. How do you handle this with the group? How do you handle this in a way that doesn't upset the game for your fellow players? Player tip number one. If one of your fellow players' characters die, rather than saying, that sucks, ask them how they're handling it. Ask them how it makes them feel. Player tip number two. If your character dies, you are allowed to mourn them. But just because your character dies doesn't mean you should leave the table. Your co-adventurers want to adventure with you even if your character isn't there. You've been on this journey with them. The loss of you 
is going to be even harder than the loss of your character. GM tip. Your players put an incredible amount of love and life into their characters. When the dice fail the character and take their lives, emotions may fly. Let the player have a moment to themselves to feel the pain of their loss. If you notice a player needs a break, take a break and let them discuss what happened with the others. Emotions are hard to handle at the table, but we are all in this together. Even if you're in your head and feel upset about how something happened to you, remember that everyone is affected and everyone needs aftercare about the situation. Witnessing the event, causing the event, or being the center of said event, all of these things are hard. Everyone is part of the adventure and the loss. One of the major parts of aftercare is being open to it. My player got upset and felt it was her fault a creature died and she didn't roll high enough to save it. I didn't even realize she was so upset until after the game when she kept repeating this. I asked her if I could sit with her and she said yes, and we talked about it. I explained that even though the creature died, what she did do was prevent the party from dying. This perspective helped her understand the situation better. She allowed me to be a part of her process and together we worked it out. I could roll on, but I'm not exactly qualified to. So instead, let's discuss this with someone who is. Today we have board certified psychologist, Dr. Megan Connell. Yay! Hello! Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So I met you because I'm writing a book on how Dungeons and Dragons has saved me from PTSD, essentially. Yes. And um, through our conversations, I'm just totally fascinated in what you do and how you're essentially helping the world by developing things. So maybe you could tell everyone else the things that you're doing. Sure. So I work at a private practice called Southeast Psych where we're focused on empowerment. We believe that everybody is a superhero in their own life and our job is to help them find their superpower and how we do that is often through adversity. And so our job as psychologists is to help people go through their difficult times in life and discover their power. And one of the things that I'm doing with that is I run two different D&D groups. And so we have one that's a girls, all girls group, and it's focused on issues of empowerment. And so we're working together with girls to teach them how to stand up and be bold in their lives through playing D&D, through you know, having these characters that can overcome adversity, that can stand up to bullies, that don't take anything, and yeah. it just to be awesome in their own lives. Then the other group that I run, I actually co-facilitate with another psychologist, Dr. Ryan Kelly. We're teaching social skills, and we're working on kids with autism, Asperger's, um, ADHD, um, social anxiety, and having them come around the table and learn how to do take perspective by jumping into their character, learning how to work together, deal with difficult situations, um, and overcome adversity, and how to be bold in a place where it's safe. There's no real world consequences. If they mess up, we can back up the game a little bit and let them try things again. So it's a beautiful way for them to help grow and develop these skills in a really fun environment. That's super cool. So um, for these different groups, was it hard to get the players engaged at first. No, it was uh, more hard to explain to the parents like how this would be <laughs> beneficial. So, But once we got people in the room and started showing them what we were doing, everybody w was on board. Um, the parents, after the first week, were coming in to say, my kid loves this group. And oh, cool. talking about how they're already seeing benefits, and you know, we're talking about these things and saying like, this is amazing how they're coming through all this stuff. So. Can you give some examples from uh, the all girls empowerment mm -hmm. group and from the uh, social skills learning group? So let me start off with the social skills group. So one of the things for people with autism and Asperger's is taking perspective. We call it theory of mind. The ability to see the world from someone else's perspective can be very challenging. And so we really work to get them into their character and understand to see the world through those eyes. And so there's a lot of time spent talking about the situation and the emotions that their character might be feeling and everybody talking. And uh, just the other week, actually, I had this beautiful moment where one of the kids was talking and he kind of looked at me and went, oh, I'm supposed to do what my character wants, not what I want him to do. And it was just this beautiful thing. As soon as he got that, he had no problem completely emerging himself in the story and just seeing the world in a different way where he was able to go, I know that he should do this stuff, but he doesn't know that, so he's going to go do something else. Do you find that because you have a group of people that are similar, that they actually see how another person interacts and reacts and says, oh, because they are like me, I also can do these things? Yes, it's definitely that feeling of community, of belonging, everybody kind of working on the same things. And it's nice to have that no judgment where you know they understand each other and they feel like they're just accepted and what they're doing is fine. Wow, that's cool because for me, like D&D &D helps me not feel alone. So I can imagine 
being in a group of people who are so similar mm -hmm. would make them feel the same. Defin That's very generous of you to do that. <laughs> Definitely. And one of the most beautiful things that came from the groups, too, is after the groups end is hearing about how they continue on that one of the kids from the groups typically will step into the DM chair and then they'll start meeting and continue playing as their own group. And That's so awesome. it's wonderful for them to build those relationships and have the, those friendships that last outside. They're growing the up. They are, it's <laughs> so, so wonderful. Exciting. So um, psychology at the table, um, mm -hmm. a, a table that's not specifically for empowerment or mm -hmm. learning social skills. How do you implement that as a game master? And I mean, I can imagine it's a delicate thing, mm -hmm. understanding that everybody's there with their own histories and uh, I hate using the word issues, mm -hmm. um, life, life complications. I don't yeah. know what to well, call we all it. Have stuff that happens to us, right? And whether we have a bad day at work, we're going through, you know, some relational problems. Um, we just didn't sleep well, you know, and that stuff comes to the table. And one of the things I think is a big challenge for DMs is how to take care of that and how to help your players when they're going through a challenge. I've actually been seeing on the D&D Reddit a lot of people who are great players and then suddenly becoming problematic players at the table. And you know, trying to think about like, well, what is going on outside of the game that could be brought, costing these problems and helping DMs understand to go and talk to their players. Like say, maybe they're getting triggered or something or yeah. they're acting out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what are some tips to help with that? Because I know I could mm -hmm. use that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think number one is expectation management. You know, mm -hmm. So that session zero is so important. And honestly, it does not matter when you have session zero. I mean, ideally, we want to have it before we start the game so we're all you know, coming <laughs> to the game with the same expectations. But if you've been playing together for months or years, it's OK to pause and have a session zero and to talk about you know, what are the topics that are a no-go for you? What are things that you do not want to see in the game? You know, where, where are your triggers? Where are the things that would be pushing this too far? And then also, I encourage people to have a session zero touch up every now and then. You know, so every th oh, that's cool. three or four months, just kind of pause the game for a moment, You know, take a little 20 minute session zero, recheck and go, is the game going in a direction that's good for you? Are there things that are concerning, things we could do better? You know, or, and have any of your you know, ideas of what's off limits changed? Wow, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> that's awesome. And you know, just saying that out loud, it feels like, oh, we can do that. Because <laughs> I feel like as a game master, you're just expected you are expected to be able to read everybody. You're expected yeah. to read everybody's mind, essentially, mm -hmm. and get it. And a lot of people want to be asked. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, well, you should know. Like, why don't you know? You know me. <laughs> We've known each other for years. It's like, well, I can't. Yeah. And, and one of the things, too, is you don't, you don't have to fix people's problems. You know, I think being a good game master is also just being a good friend, being a good human. If you notice someone at your table is having a hard time, to sit down and say, hey, what's going on? And don't expect that you're going to be able to fix their problem. That's not your job. Yeah. But it's incredibly powerful just to have someone hear what's going on with you and just to listen to it without judgment and to go, wow, okay, you got a lot going on. You know, and then if you feel comfortable to ask, is there anything I can do? Is there anything we can do in the game to help you? And oftentimes the answer to that's going to be no, but just listening can go a very long way for somebody. So, all right. Um, I didn't write this down, but say you have somebody who you have triggered mm -hmm. and you're in the game with them and they're doing their thing. I mean, it's as a friend, you want to like, oh, 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 you want to yeah. get there and yeah. be like, okay, what, how, how, <laughs> what? Um, but what would you recommend doing when you when somebody is seriously starting to pull away mm -hmm. or act out? Like, what can you do in the moment? I think in the moment it, to take a pause. So one of the things that I do with the therapy groups is the DM screen itself is a symbol. It's a prop. So when it's up, I am the dungeon master, and we're running a game. But every now and then stuff happens, and I fold it up, and I set it down. And then the game's on pause, and we're now talking about what's going on. We're talking the process. We're saying... You know, okay, I see someone's getting frustrated here. Can we explain what's going on? Do we need to take a five minute break? Everybody cool down and come back and chat. And just to have that kind of symbol symbology of now I'm stepping out of this role, I'm kind of coming back into the friend role or the peer role. And that can be something very powerful. Um, if you do notice that something, you know, triggered somebody, they're getting angry, talk to them. I mean, like, that's just like, I, I, it's surprising like how often people haven't talked to them. They just see a problem and they're just going, gosh, what's wrong with this person? It's like, yeah. have you asked? Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of times it's like, oh no, 
go talk to them. And, and if see. they don't want to talk, just kind of let them. Let them be. Yeah. yeah. You know, and just leave the door open if you feel comfortable with them. Saying like, hey, okay, well, when you're ready to talk about it, I'm here. Cool. As a dungeon master, it mm -hmm. can be really intimidating when you're sitting there and you've got all your whole story written down and you're trying to get all the pieces right and your friend brings in a friend who has some issues and mm -hmm. you know that they are a little more delicate. Like, um, how? what would you say to a dungeon master who is afraid to game with somebody that is more emotional than others? The, first off, there's nothing to be afraid of. They're just another <laughs> human. <laughs> you know, we're all humans, and we're all really complicated, and we all have different things. And to understand that, you know, this is a community that can be welcoming. It can be a safe place for anybody. If you're worried about stuff, you know, sit down and talk with them. Again, that number one issue, just have a conversation. Communication. You know, <laughs> not, not in front of everybody, and you know, maybe pull them to the side after the game and check in frequently of saying, like, hey, was this okay with you? Is, you know, um, you know, sometimes we have players who are super distractible from, say they have really bad ADHD and they're kind of all over the place. And mm -hmm. so we maybe create a little word or a phrase that we say to kind of bring them back into the game or something. Oh, cool. That's you cool. You know, and checking in with them and seeing, like, is that working for you? Are you feeling too singled out? Is this helpful? And, and be willing to adapt and to work with them. You know, I think if you can learn how to accommodate and how to be flexible, it's going to allow more people to be at your table, which that's great. I mean, the more D&D &D there is out there, the yeah, better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In our pre-interview, yes. you actually brought up a phrase that I thought was completely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Disability can be an advantage. Yes. It's seeing the world differently. Uh, so sp thinking with just any kind of uh, psychological you know, problem that someone might have, they're seeing the world in a different way than everybody else. And that can be such an advantage by seeing the world differently and understanding that. And that can really bring a unique perspective to the game. You know, seeing, understanding that things are a little bit different and having that unique view, it broadens the world, it makes it more complicated, it makes it more interesting. And so it can be I, just a wonderful thing to have people who see things slightly differently and understand things slightly differently. It helps us grow and, you know, I think one of the things for humans is we have to keep growing, we have to keep expanding ourselves. And by inviting people who are slightly different than us or see the world differently, come from a different culture, come from different backgrounds, that helps us grow and develop and it makes for a more unique gaming experience and more fun at the table. Cool. Um, any more tips to dungeon masters out there, game masters? Yeah. What can you share? Listen to your players. <laughs> Talk to them and listen to them. And remember, you're making a game for them. You're making a world for them. And if they're going through something bad in their life, you know, maybe they need to have a heroic moment. You know, maybe your, your game's not necessarily always heroic, but someone needs something to pick them up. And so give them that, you know, opportunity. Um, maybe they're going through a bad breakup and they need to, you know, fight a monster that's the symbol of their ex or something, you know, something <laughs> like that, you know, give them that kind of flexibility. Or like, if life's been super serious, maybe it's time for your players to stumble upon a harvest festival and to have a pie eating contest or something. You know, be willing to adapt your game a little bit to help meet your players where they are emotionally and help to bring them up. Because we're all there together. Yeah. And that just makes sense. Cool. Okay, I'm going to ask you three questions. Yes. What is your pre-game house rule? We're all here to have fun. We're here to support one another. We're working together as a team. That includes me as the GM. Even if I'm controlling a lot of monsters that are trying to kill you, <laughs> we're still all in this together. And so let's work together. If there's a problem at the table, we're going to talk it out. We're going to work it out. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Favorite GM moment? Uh, this comes from the first girls group I ran. Uh, so we were about halfway through, and after one of the games, uh, one of the girls pulled me aside afterwards, and she wanted to tell me of an experience she had where in her school someone was asking her to do something that it wasn't something she was really comfortable with, but she was a people pleaser. And so she wanted to say yes. And she said, I was on the cusp of saying yes when I thought about my D&D character. And I realized there was no way in hell my D&D character would have done this. <laughs> and so I decided to be my D&D character, and I said no. And oh, I wow. didn't do it. And like that was such a big win. It was an amazing moment. Oh, that's really <laughs> cool. Quick tip to the audience. Again, listen to your players, talk to them. That repeating session zero every few months, I think it's just a huge thing to do. Mm -hmm. And checking in with them and just seeing how people are doing. 
That is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Please tell all of them where we can find you on the internet. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Megan Sidey. That's P-S-Y-D. And I'm also on uh, geekslikeus.com. Uh, where I have YouTube and a Twitch channel under that as well, where I DM some games online. Oh, very cool. You guys got to watch this. <laughs> as always, I'm Satine Phoenix. At Satine Phoenix, you can ask me GM tip questions at hashtag AskSatine. Pick up and play one of my Guild Add-Up supplements for the Tomb of Annihilation at dmsguild.com. Watch me on Sagas of Sundry Dread on projectalpha.com. Catch me live every Sunday at noon on Maze Arcana's Orphan Echo on twitch.tv slash Maze Arcana. And every Tuesday night, Dungeon Mastering on twitch.tv slash dnd. Thanks for watching us here on Geek and Sundry, and we'll see you next time. But wait, <gasps> would you please GM us out of here? I would love to. You're walking down the well-worn path, your father's sword sitting at your side, its weight still feeling new to you. You have on a new set of clothing, a pack on your back, and a sense of adventure in your heart. You're ready to go out and prove yourself to the world. You crest the hill overlooking the orchard, looking down at the new blooms of spring when suddenly the world starts to fade. You hear a roaring in your ears. You instinctively close your eyes and a sense of vertigo overtakes you. Wood smoke, the crisp air touching your face. You open your eyes to see a canopy of red and orange leaves above you, watching as one softly detaches itself and flutters down next to your face. You turn your head to see the glowing embers of a dying campfire. You stand, seeing four others around you slowly starting to come to consciousness. You look down and notice your father's sword still at your side. It's weight no longer feeling foreign. It feels comfortable, as though it's an extension of you. Looking at your clothes, you see patches, sewn tears that weren't there before. Suddenly you hear this loud caca! Looking up, you see a gigantic bird, larger than anything you think should exist, flying off towards humongous snow-capped mountains, higher than any you've ever seen before. You let out a breath that turns to frosted vapor in the air, as you try to steady your rapidly beating heart and trembling hands as one question grips you. Where am I? <laughs>